Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. With everything that's going on in this world today, you yet still sit on the throne. So, Father, we thank you for that. No, the sky is not falling because you're not falling, God. You are the same today and forevermore. Just help us to get through each and every day and be prayerful and mindful of your love. Amen? Amen. 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 Today I'm going to talk about big faith because with everything that's going on in this world today, we need big faith. You see, storms rise in our life, some worse than others, the perfect storm, if you will. There is so much water, you can't see land. Can you imagine seeing so much water where there's no land, there's no help? You can't even get on a rock. And it's too much water to tread water. So you have to have that faith. This is so much water you can't see land. And like I said, you can't see help. We start calling everybody. We call the pastor. We call this person and we call that person. But we don't call God. Why we don't call God? He is the author and finisher of our faith. That means whatever's going on in our life, he's there to help us. But we don't call him. We call you, Pat. What can you do? Nothing. What can you do, Pastor? Nothing. But we need to be calling on God. Why, why is that? Well, I don't know. I wish I had an answer, but I don't know. But it's a good question. So why do we call on God last? Isn't that baffling? It, it's, it makes you be like, hmm, why do we do that? Because we think that this particular, this one and only problem, we must handle ourselves. But if we could handle it, it would be done already. Is that not right? It would be done so why do we still wait and call on God after the fact, after the sky has fallen, after we're about to drown, after we get kicked out, after we lose our job, after we lose and lose and lose and lose? Then we want to call God. If I was God, which I'm not, I would be like, don't call me now. What you calling me now for? You should have called me way back when, when the water was up here. You should have called me before they fired you. You should have called me before your car broke down. You should have, you should have, you should have, you should have. But we don't. Why? And we know he can step right in and change the whole situation. We know at a snap of his finger, he can do the impossible. He can open the unopenable. He can open windows that the world has shut. He can heal your body when the doctors tell you there's nothing else I can do. But still, we wait to call him last. I'd be like, look, I'm busy. I'm trying to help the people that's been calling me all along. I ain't got time for you right now. But I'll get back. Or he can say, beep, leave your name and your situation, and I'll call you back. But he doesn't say that. He doesn't do that. Why? Because he loves us. And he just wait for us to call on him. It's a good thing he's not one of us, because you'll never get my, my call back. It's like calling a friend. You're constantly calling, 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 and she never call you back. I'm a little, uh, I do that sometimes. <laughs> I just, it just hit my mind. I thought about Jackie. <laughs> she had been calling me for the word, the word, the names of God. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do that. Go home and don't do it. And don't do it. And don't do it. But see, God don't do that. If you ask him something, he's going to answer you. So why do we wait till the last moment? I don't get it. Psalms 121, 1-2 reads, We must be strong. Well, I'm saying we must be strong. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. And my help comes from where? 
the Lord, which made what? So there's nothing that will go on that he can't fix, change, heal, rearrange. Are y'all following me? Because y'all too quiet out there. You know I don't like quiet. Well, well, that must mean that there is nothing that God can't handle. So as the winds of life howl and the seas of disappointment rages, as the waves of despair are roaring, and then to add insult to injury, the ship begins to take on water. Now, you thought you were scared before? You're really scared now because you got that little solo cup <laughs> dipping out water. But water's coming in faster than you can dip out. Who should you be talking to? I'm just saying. Mark 4, 38 to 41 reads, A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat on the boat, so that it was already, like I said, filling. But he, God, our Savior, was in the stern of the ship, sleep on a cushion. He wasn't even worried. He was asleep on the cushion. And here we come to wake him up. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose, but he arose and he didn't say not one word to the people that woke him up. He arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. How many of you know after a storm, there's always a great calm? A calm that says, Phew, I made it through that storm. 40, but he said to them, why are you so fearful? I'm going to paraphrase. I'm asleep on the ship. You think I don't know the winds are blowing? You think I don't know the, the, the waves are beating against the water? I know everything. I see everything. How is it that you have no faith? 41, and they feared exceedingly, and they said one to another, how can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? But my question to you is this, God, once you've given your life to God, even before, he was always there. He was always there looking out for you watching you make mistakes, watching you take the wrong road, watching you hook up with the wrong person, watching you be ugly, watching you when you're trying to hide from God. He's always there. So why wouldn't he control the sea? Why wouldn't the winds listen to him? But the problem with that is we don't. Why aren't we obedient? We want our children to be obedient. You better listen to me. But then God says, you need to listen to me. So how you want them to listen if you don't listen? Obedience work both ways. God wants us to be obedient to him. We want our children to be obedient to us. But if we're not obedient to God, and you want to know what's wrong, Obedience, it don't run in the family. No, I just did that. <laughs> I just say, I just want to throw that in. Here is another good story. You, you want to hear some more stories about faith, trusting God with our storms of life. See, we don't want to trust him. We want to fix it that we can't fix it. But the storms keep raging, and they're still not fixed, and we want to know why. Why ain't got no money? Why ain't got no car? Why ain't got no house? Why, 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 why? That sounds like a song. Why, 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 why? 
why we don't have these things? Because we're not trusting in God. We're not giving him everything. We'll give him, okay, God, you handle that, but I got this. But you ain't got this because if you got this, then this wouldn't be messed up. So give it all to God. Stop taking a little bit and then giving him the rest. It's like you don't trust him. I trust you to fix that, but you can't fix that. Why do we do that? Why does our faith waver and shake and, and shimmer? Is that what it is? It's a good thing God know that. You know? She said, because we're human. And God knows this. But the more we read and the more we study and the more we trust and the more we believe and adhere to, our faith gets stronger. It gets stronger. It's like people that work out. My son bought an exercising thing. I ain't seen him on it. But he bought an exercising <laughs> thing. <laughs> and he bought it to build up his muscles. Exercise. But we need to take that same strength and exercise our faith. Our faith needs to be exercised. Don't let it sit on the side in the way with clothes and stuff. And towels and stuff on top of it. You have to exercise your faith. We worried about muscles. How about your heart? What about the muscle in your heart? What about your brain? All of that goes together. It has to be exercised. I know you want to be bust, baby. I understand. <laughs> All that stuff wants, but you got to exercise your relationship with God. Make your faith stronger. Give your faith muscles. Give your faith strength that when things go on in life, you can say, I'm going to be okay because I got faith and I got strength and I got God. Amen. <laughs> Matthew 14, 28, 32 reads another story about faith. Peter Peter saw Jesus walking on the water. So Peter said, if it be you, master, tell me to come to you on the water. Can you imagine walking on water? He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water, and he came toward Jesus. Now, he was fine. He's walking on water towards Jesus. But when he perceived and felt the strong wind, he was frightened. And as he began to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me from death. And instantly, Jesus reached out his hand and caught and held him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, Peter was already walking on the water. God already granted him that. He was fine until he took his eyes off God, until he looked at all that water, until he felt that wind blowing him to and fro, and he looked down. But see, we can't do that. We have to keep our eyes on God. Because once you look down, you start to sink. He was fine. We're fine when we're praying. We're fine when we're trusting in God. We're fine when we're praying. We're fine when we're trusting in God. It's like when a child falls and you'd be like, okay, oh, you're fine. And he pops back up. But when that kid, or if we say, oh, my God. Then the kid falls apart. He ain't even hurt, but he falls apart. We do that. We do that. And we're not kids. We're human. But we do that. Why do we do that? I'm going to ask God that when I die. <laughs> I am. I have a list of questions I want to ask him. And I pray I make it up there so I can ask him. See, I lost my spot. The wind sees. You see, all God wants from us is big faith. 
He didn't say any big faith. Yes, he said faith the size of a mustard seed. But that's before you start exercising your faith. That's before you start reading about faith. That's before you have that relationship with God. Exercise your faith. Ask God for what you want. But then at the same time, what are you going to give up to get? What are you going to give up? I like to drink, but I ain't giving that up. God, that's a little much. I like to smoke. I'm, hmm. Okay, I'll cut down to half a pack. You're making a deal. Why do you think you need to make a deal? What does God say? Come as you are, and I will do the rest. But no, when I stop smoking, I'll come to church. When I stop drinking, I'll come to church. When I have time, I'll come to church. Well, this is a pandemic. Oh, you got it, time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All you have is time. So what's stopping you now? Oh, I know what it is. You got to take the towel off the exercising machine. You got to move the socks and the pants. You got to move all that stuff out the way. I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me slow down. I tend to speed up and pass what I, yeah. So, you see, God wants big faith. Those other stories didn't help you? I have another story for you. We're going to do Daniel chapter 3. Yes? I know you're aware of the story of the three Hebrew boys. Big faith, outrageous faith. Now there was King Nebuchadnezzar, and I pronounced his name wrong. Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know where they got these names from, but <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king at the time, and it was three Hebrew boys. Boy, they didn't get, but they didn't get fearful because they had faith. They had that unmovable, unshakable faith. So they told King Nebuchadnezzar, he built these idols of gold. And at a certain time, he wanted people to bow. I think when they rang a bell, they had to bow down. No matter what they was doing, whatever the situation was, when he rang this bell, you had to kneel. But the three Hebrew boys told him, oh, king that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden images which you have set aside. That's what they told him. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and his facial expressions was, had changed. So you imagine when someone do something to you, and you're like, you're not doing it? You're not cleaning that room? That's how he got. So... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore, he commanded that the furnace should be heated seven times hotter than it usually was. Seven times hotter. I'm, I'm trying to imagine this furnace. It must have been huge. You're going to heat up something seven times. This is how mad he was. Seven times hotter than it originally was. And he commanded that the strongest men in his army to bound the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. But the thing about that is so funny that the men that bound them and got them ready to throw in the fire, they burnt up their self. They burnt up. But Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego, they all had on all their clothes, their turbans. They had everything on, and they bound them. And I keep getting ahead of myself. I'm so sorry. And they bound them up. And like I said, it burnt up the three men. But they threw them in the fire, bound. That means you can't move. You can't run. You can't do anything. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, 
and the furnace exceedingly hot. The flames and sparks, like I said earlier, had killed those men who bound them up instantly. Can you imagine how hot that must be to instantly burn them up? I mean, I, I can't even imagine. So they threw the boys into the fire. Now the king is there, and all his people are there, and they witness them throw him, throw them into the fire. They witness it. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, saw and was astonished. He said, after he jumped up, he said, counselors, see, I'm trying to read this. Y'all read this. Counselors, did we not throw three men into the fiery furnace, bound? Did we not do that? In the midst of the fire, then they answered, true, king. He answered, behold, I see four men loose. Now, remember, they bound them up. I see four men loose in the fire, walking around. How are you walking around in the midst of a furnace? Heated seven times high. It burnt up the men, and they wasn't even in there. As soon as they opened the doors, they instantly burnt up. They're walking around in the fire. And they are not hurt. And the flames and the form of the fourth man. See, I can't read that. The king noticed there was a fourth man in the furnace with them. So, but wait a minute. They threw how many in there? Three. Now the king says there's four. He said, how is that? And they're walking around. I know we bound them. I, I saw you bound them. I saw them fall down in the fire. But why do I see them walking around? And to, to make it even crazier, there's four. He's like, wait a minute. Four. We didn't throw four in there. But he said they're walking around. They're not hurt. And the fourth looks like a son of God. Who is that fourth person? Jesus. He was that fourth person because of their faith. And that's some crazy faith. Now, let's think about this for a minute. You standing in front of the thing and it's fiery hot. Are you going to be like, now, wait a minute, king. Now, we can talk about this. What if I get down on one knee? Will that be okay? Will that be good enough for you? Okay, but what if I stand on the side and when you ring the bell, I'll just duck into the corner, and then everybody else will fall down. Trying to make a deal. But they didn't have to do that because they had Jesus with them, and they knew they had Jesus with them. But then the, the, the kicker to the whole thing is, never the king came out, and he called to them, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, come out of there. So here they come, walking out of the fiery furnace, seven times hotter than they ever make it. And they come out walking around. It's like they say, yeah, what's up? <laughs> they come out walking around. He said, but they don't smell like smoke. Their hair is not singed. Their tunics is not singed. We're going we gonna to pray to your God because your God is the one and only God. But that's big faith. And sometimes we can't even do that. And we ain't even in front of no fiery furnace. We're not in front of a firing squad or, or whatever the case is. And we still can't do. We, sometimes it's hard to do the little mustard seed faith. But you want God to help you with the big things in life. And you want it done quickly. Like the microwave. Boop, 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 boop. Boop. And you're eating. No. You have to exercise your faith. If I was you, I'd just get rid of the, the exercise thing because all it's doing is taking up room. I'm still on you, but I'm just saying. 
pick up your Bible, exercise, read, lift your hands up to God, read, kneel. You can kneel up and down, but you're reading. Exercise your faith, never mind your appearance, because this will fade away. Will it not? It will fade away. It always fades away. I'm beautiful now, but soon I won't be. No. <laughs> You're beautiful now, but soon we won't be. But we'll be beautiful in here because God judges us from the inside out. You can be toothless, one eye, kickstand, and God still loves you. And he greets you. He say, Terry, where you been? I've been looking for you. Your eye looks good. He don't care about that. Inside out, not outside. We are concerned with the outside. We ain't got time to pray in the morning because we're too busy getting the outside together. Matching up the outside. But the outside don't mean, I've seen some beautiful people and they're so ugly inside. I'm just saying, tell me you haven't. So it's the inside. It's your heart. Exercise that by praying and talking to God. God, help me. I need help. Amen. Amen. Okay. You need another story? Just in case you still ain't got it. About big faith, unshakable, unmovable faith? Okay. What about the story of Abraham? Is everybody familiar with that story of Abraham? Abraham had mystifying faith. I mean, just crazy faith. You know? Uh-uh. Crazy faith. But let me tell you something about Abraham before I start. Abraham was 100 years old and didn't have any kids. His wife, Rebecca, was 99 years old. Now, back in the day, you had to have kids. That, that shows that you're blessed. Rebecca didn't have any. So every day she went down to the water by herself and watched all these ladies trace their 7, 12. They had a lot of kids back there, 13 kids. The first 9 or 10 was boys. And she's there. Now you know how women can be. Oh, where's your kid, Rebecca? Knowing full well she don't have any. But when are you going to have some? But now she's 99 years old. Who want to be pregnant at 99 years old? <laughs> Beverly? Any takers? 99 years old, she got pregnant. She had him, I believe, when she was 100. 100 years old. In the desert, nine months pregnant. I can't even carry me around sometimes. <laughs> but she was 100 years old and she gave birth because God told her. He didn't say when, but I'm sure they was thinking in their 30s. Okay, maybe in my 40s. Okay, 60s, 70s. You still don't want to be pregnant at that age. 99 years old. So they waited a long time for Isaac. That's what the point I'm trying to get to you guys. Abraham had said to him, I'm sorry, I skipped the part. After these events, God tested and proved Abraham. Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. God said, take now your son, your only son Isaac. Now, I just told you how long he waited for Isaac. Whom you love, only child he had. And go to the region of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt sacrifice upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you now. This sounds crazy. I waited a hundred years to have one son, and now you want me to sacrifice him. This is a joke, right? Okay, I'm going to wait here until you tell me what you really want, because I know good and well you don't want me to sacrifice my one and only son that I waited for a long time. Tell me that's not crazy. It's crazy. So can you imagine what Abraham must have been thinking? 
I know what I'd have been thinking. I ain't doing it. You're going to have to come up with something else. You want to test me? Do something else. But this, I ain't doing it. Like we tell God, fix this. But this, I don't want you to touch. Because then that means I would have to do something. And all he wanted to do was test his faith. That's a big test. You all agree with me? That's a, that's a, whoo, God, you sure you want me to do that? Can I do that? I don't want to do that. But are you sure you want me to do that? And God didn't say anything else to him. He gave him instructions. And that was one to three. I'm going to read six to 13. Amplified. It's Genesis, Genesis 22. 6 to 13. I have to read it out of my Bible. I can't follow the screen. I'm challenged. (laughs) Then Abraham took the wood. Well, no, I'm ahead of myself. God had told him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Now, this is a three-day walk. And Abraham said to his servant, settle down and stay here with the donkey. And I... And the young man will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Then Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son's shoulders, Isaac, his son. And he took the fire, which they call the fire bucket, in his own hand and a knife. And the two of them went out together. Now, in in, in his mind, he's going to do what God asked him to do. Because his faith was so big and so outrageous that he didn't doubt what God told him to do. You told me to do this, I'm going to do it. Magnificent faith. That's just unbelievable faith. And Isaac said to Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Isaac said, see here are the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt sacrifice? Now, how many of your kids would you have been able to to convince to go with you? There's no fire. I mean, there's no burnt offering. There's no offering. It's just y'all. Now, that's he's asking him, well, where's all this stuff at? We going up here to praise God and stuff, but we don't have no offering. Abraham said, my son, God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them went up together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there. Then he laid the wood in the altar, and then he bound his son. Now, being that sometimes we're not obedient and our kids are not obedient, how many of your kids would have let you do that? You going to put me where? You going to do what? You going to light what? And you're going to lay me down on it. Okay, where's the cameras? Because this got to be a joke. You're going to lay me on there? I'm just going to let you lay me on there. Yeah, well, I'm out. You have to find something. That's our generation. But that generation, they followed their parents to a T. Because their parents followed God to a T. And Abraham stretched forth, well, I'm sorry. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there, and then he laid the wood out, bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on the wood. Now, think of yourself as Isaac. What are you saying? What are you thinking? I thought he loved me. Now he's going to burn me. How how is that? How did we get to this point? Okay, I'll clean my room when we get home. (laughs) Okay, I'll do my studies when we get home, but can you take me off this altar? Yeah, yeah. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took hold of the knife to slay his son. That's how much faith he had. 
because he's thinking, if I kill my son, God's going to bring him right back. Because there's a reason God is telling me to do this. He's not telling me to do something because he just wants me to kill his son, kill um, my son. There's a reason behind this. And when God gives you instructions, that means it's already worked out. From soup to nuts, it's already, he's worked it out. You don't have to worry about nothing. There's a reason. But all you have to do is have that faith. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham. You know he had to be yelling. I'm thinking, Abraham. And he answered, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear and revere God. You fear and revere God. Since you have not held back from me or begrudged giving me your son, your only son. See, sometimes God asks us to do stuff. And he want to know if we're going to do it or not. How big is your faith? Is it outrageous, unmovable, unshakable? How big is it? How much exercise you've been doing? Because to do something like this, you have to be exercising your faith. You have to be. Because other than that, your natural mind will be like, this ain't happening. But when you have that faith, and you trust and believe and rely on God, you'll do what he tells you to do or what he asks you to do. Amen? Then Abraham looked up and glanced around, and behold, and behold, him was a ram caught in the thicket by the thorn, by, the, by his horns. Where did he come from? He didn't come up there with him. I don't think he was in the cut. So then it would be safe to say God provided this lamb after Abraham started to do what God told him to do. Are, are you following me? Am, am, am I boring you? You sure? Okay. And Abraham went, at, went and looked and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering. I'm, I'm, I'm standing here, and I'm, I'm going back and forth with myself. Could you do that? That's, could you do that? Never mind your only begotten son. Could you do that? You can, but you got to have that faith. The sacrifice instead of his son. God provided a sacrifice instead of his son. God provides you a way out instead of the way you're taken. God provides you with what you need and not what you want. God heals you. God saves you. God sets you free. All you need is faith. All you need is faith. All you need is faith. It sounds so simple. But we don't exercise our faith. We rather cry and whine and why me and why we and why, 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 when all we have to do is exercise our faith. All we have to do is trust and believe. It sounds so simple. But is it? What stops you from having that big faith? What in your life is holding you back from trusting and believing and doing what God tells you to do? It got to be something, but you got to figure out what that something is. You got to figure it out because that something is keeping you from moving on closer to God, from trusting and believing and relying on him. I ask you again, who's in the stern of your ship, asleep on the cushion of life? 
are raging and you begin sinking, what do you do? Pray. You're going through tough times? Pray. Now undoubtedly discouraged? Pray. You're at the point where you, whew, pray. You're at the point where your storms of life is no longer manageable. Why did we think we could manage it in the first place? Or you can't breathe. What do you do? Pray. Don't talk about it. Be about it. The waves of life are all over your head. What do you do? Pray. You can't take this pandemic. The numbers are going higher and higher. People still die in schools, closing, job security. You don't know. How am I going to pay my bills? Pray. Things are not going to be the same anymore. Pray. But how about this? Maybe God don't want them to be the same anymore. You don't want it to be the same anymore. So what should you do? Pray. Another wave of life rolls in. Pray. Don't call nobody. Pray. You can't catch your breath before another storm of life rolls in. What do you do? Pray. Because it seems like once the storm starts, there's another. Then there's another. Then there's another. And each wave is higher than the one before. You can't control them. What do you do? You pray. You stop, rock, and pray. Why is this happening to me? That's not the question. Stop listening to the devil's news that there is no God. And just pray. Because he tell you there's no God. Oh, he can't help you. Oh, you're too far gone. You done did too many drugs. You done smoked too many cigarettes. You done stole. You done this. You done that. No, no, no. No condemnation in God. Just pray. And remember, after the storms, you have to clean up your life. Because then the same storms will keep coming back. Then you'll really be asking why. Make sure. You clean up your life. Make sure you get rid of the devil by exercising your faith. Making sure that there is no driftwood for you to trip on to go back to where you were. No doubt, because doubt will paralyze you. No garbage, because it stinks. The garbage in our life. No seaweed that can choke you. No more being fearful. No worry. Hanging around that will separate you from the love of Christ. What will separate you from the love of Christ? What do you let separate you from the love of Christ? And why? Call on God first. Pray to God first. Call on the name of Jesus first because the power, there is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. So I leave you with this again. Mark 4, 37, 41. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern of the ship, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful. Why are we so fearful of the little things, the medium-sized things, the big? We're just scared. How is it that you have no faith? All that God has done for you, 
all the trials and tribulations he's brought you from. Brought you from the darkness into the marvelous light. Washed away your sins. Cleaned up your urge for drugs. Cleaned up your urge for cussing and fighting. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Why we don't have no faith? And we say, yeah, I got faith. Do you use your faith? Or you would believe in the world? You got to do it by yourself. You don't need nobody, nobody but you. But God didn't make us to be by ourselves. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, how can this be that even the wind and sea obey him? How could it be that God has done so much for us and we still don't know who he is? How could that be? He picked you up, turned you around, placed your feet on solid ground. How can this be that even the winds and the seas obey him? How could it be that we don't know who he is? We don't remember what he's done for us. How could it be? When it's good times, we don't say a word to God. But as soon as the bad time hit, oh, God, where are you? Help me. Exercise your faith where you can pray in the good, the bad, and the ugly. So when you're storing up all these prayers and all this faith, it's already there for you. You just have to trust and believe and know that God has your back. Stop looking at this world through our natural eyes. Remember, we walk by what? Faith. By faith and not by sight. So I ask you one more time, who is in the stern of your ship? Who is in the stern of your life? Asleep in the cushion. That you, that we, insist on calling him last. Questions you have to ask yourself. Who's running my ship? Who's controlling my life? Just things to ask. We should all have big faith. We know who God is. We know what he's done. The world may not know, but we know. So if we exercise our faith, we can bring it to someone else and tell them about how good God is and what he did for me and what he'll do for me, he'll do for you because he has no respect to person. But you got to have faith. Not just faith. Exercising faith unchangeable faith. I don't care what's going on. I'm trusting God. Yeah, I got these bills. I'm trusting God because he's going to take care because he knows what I need. But you got to have faith. Without faith, how are you going to do that? Exactly. So I'm going to leave you with these few scriptures. It's just three. Second Corinthians 5.7 for we walk by faith and not by sight. Sometimes we need to just close our eyes. Never mind what's going on. Get in a quiet place. Find a room, a closet, and sit down in there and just talk to God. Okay, God, I know I took the wrong turn. Tell me which turn, how to go back and take the right turn. I know I said something that wasn't right. Help me to change that. Help me to have the courage to go back to that person and apologize. Help me be a better person. You got to find some place quiet. I want to change my life. Find some place quiet and talk with God. Commune with God. Walk with God. Matthew 28, 20. I am with you always. There is nothing going on in your life that God is not there. Nothing. He is always with you. And he stands by you quietly. And wait for you to say something. He's not going to be pushy and shovey and loud and, and outrageous. No, he's going to wait for you to say, you know what, God? I surrender. I can't do this no more. I can't feel like this no more. I can't act like this no more. I can't walk or talk like this anymore. Isaiah 40.10. <laughs> Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, 
for I am your God. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment, Lord. I thank you for being able to come before your people, Jesus, and tell them what you want from us. Lord, help us to achieve this closeness. Help us to achieve a better faith with you, Lord, a better faith-driven life that we can do all things through Christ that strengthen us. No matter what's going on in this world, we trust you. We're exercising our faith. We want that outrageous faith, that big faith, that faith that makes other people say, hmm, let me ask them about that, how they overcome that. Help us to walk and talk in your way. Help us to speak life and not death. Help us to be mindful of the people around us. Lord, help us to be mindful of ourselves. We thank you for this day, and we thank you for everyone that is here. Let this word go and grow in Jesus' name. Amen.